Okay, this lecture covers um, most of chapter four. Um, there is um, additional lecture, hopefully you watched already from chapter one that covers the first few objectives um, in chapter four, and then there will be a separate lecture on the technique of centrifugation. So let's just talk about some more terms to kind of Hopefully you've been exposed to these, kind of remind you, get your brain going again about cell biology. Um, we will talk a lot about transport across membranes um, in chapter eight. I also want you to remember that um, in addition to transport proteins that are located in the plasma membrane, cells can bring in or remove larger either larger objects or bulk production of, say, proteins um, in and out of a cell by exocytosis and endocytosis. So this first one is exocytosis. Exo means going out, think exit. So this is a way to move large molecules or large amounts of molecules. And in this case, for exocytosis, it's moving the molecules out of the cell. Okay, So this exocytic vesicle, um, this is from a different uh, language, so we usually spell vesicle with an E. Um, you're going to see that these are also called secretory for secretion vesicles. So secretion means it's going out of the cell. So for instance, your B cells that are part of your immune system make antibodies. And antibodies are secreted out of the cell through exocytosis. The antibody proteins themselves are too big to be able to move directly through the membrane, even with a transport protein or a channel protein. Um, so they need to go uh, through this large or bulk, sometimes it's called bulk transport, Having a hard time spelling today. Transport, and that's exocytosis. What's really cool is um, remember that membranes are membranes are membranes, and so you can see that these secretory vesicles are also made up of a phospholipid bilayer, and the plasma membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. So what actually happens is these vesicles come and they fuse together, right? So think of Play-Doh and you smoosh the more Play-Doh on there. They fuse together and so that the contents of this vesicle are now open um, to the outside of the cell. Just the opposite is endocytosis, right? And that means taking something inside the cell really having issues. Okay. So this is a way, again, that cells can bring in mass molecules. Um, you've probably heard of phagocytosis. A really classic example of phagocytosis is when uh, macrophage, which is a white blood cell of your immune system, eats a bacteria. Um, and so the um, macrophage cell will basically reach out and surround this bacteria and bring it in and destroy it. So phagocytosis is what we call kind of eating. And then there's also pinocytosis, which is like drinking. So sometimes a cell will bring in a large mass of fluid that's outside and whatever is dissolved in that fluid. 
And so you can nicely, I think a little better here, see this idea of the membranes pinching in, right? So here's the cell membrane, it's grabbing all this material, it's pinching in, and then it pinches off into another transport vesicle. Um, these are also called endosomes, and we're going to get into all of this more later. Um, just want to get, get your brain going with these um, cell biology uh, terms. Okay, so exocytosis and endocytosis, one should be familiar with those terms. Um, the endomembrane system we're going to talk a lot about in um, chapter 12. And, um, and exocytosis and endocytosis we will also cover in um, chapter 12. And so the endomembrane system is um, a coordinated group of some of the organelles in eukaryotic cells. It consists of the nuclear envelope shown in purple. And remember that the nucleus is surrounded by a double membrane and that's the nuclear envelope. So you can kind of see here in purple, there's two, two lines. Um, so the nucleus, and we're going to talk about why we think that is, has a double membrane. And right outside of the nucleus is the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER. And there is both smooth and rough ER. We're going to talk about the rough ER is rough because it has ribosomes and hopefully you remember ribosomes are important important for protein synthesis. The other part of the endoplasmic reticulum is the smooth ER and it's smooth because it doesn't have the ribosomes but instead one of its big functions in all cells is to make lipids. So all of these, um, not only lipids, but also membranes, which are made of lipids, are generated over here by the smooth ER. And the smooth ER in different cells has different functions such as um, especially in the liver cells, it functions in detoxification and um, in cells it can function um, in uh, fatty acid metabolisms. So smooth ER, rough ER, right outside the nucleus. If you were making a protein that is going through the endomembrane system, this is the path of protein production. Now we're going to learn, uh, I think not until, la 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 la, well maybe it's chapter 16 and 19. Um, yeah, 16 and 19. That not all proteins are made or are you use the endomembrane system, but the ones that do, um, remember that also in the nucleus is your DNA, and also this is the site of transcription which hopefully you remember transcription is when you copy DNA to an RNA molecule. So that RNA will come out, it will uh, associate with a ribosome, and if that protein is using the endomembrane system, um, it will go to the rough ER. And one of the things that happens in the rough ER is protein um, glycosylation glycosylation means adding sugars that also happens in the Golgi and you probably really learned about it in the Golgi but I want you to know when we go into chapter 16 and 19 you're going to see that a lot of the glycosylation actually starts um, on the rough ER, in the rough ER, and then as the protein 
uh, moves to the Golgi, it gets further modification. So the Golgi is this brown outside, this stack of membranes. Um, let's see, running out of room, so I'm just going to erase some of this. So the Golgi is where proteins are packaged and sorted and modified, including glycosylation as well. And then they're kind of shipped off to their destination. You can see on this diagram some little circles here. These are vesicles. So a vesicle, let me raise this up here. So a vesicle is basically a little membrane sac for transport. So in general, call a lot of these transport vesicles. You will also see some called, let me change color here, transition vesicles. Transition vesicles you usually find moving things from the ER to the Golgi and from the different stacks of the Golgi right so here we've got maybe a vesicle bringing some protein from the ER to the Golgi and then we've got some more um, vesicles moving uh, proteins let's say from Golgi stack to Golgi stack sac, sorry, um, different Golgi sacs have different functions as far as protein modification and tagging. Um, another part of the endomembrane system is the lysosome. I like to call the lysosome the garbage disposal. Because it's really important in breaking down molecules or things that are brought into um, the cell. And again, we're going to go in more depth um, at the end of chapter 12 with a lot of this. Um, plasma membrane is also part of the endomembrane system. So you've got the nuclear envelope, the ER, the Golgi, the lysosome, the plasma membrane, and vesicles. And don't get confused, plasma membrane is the same as cell membrane. And then what this diagram is showing you is that exocytosis, so stuff leaving the cell, or endocytosis, stuff going into the cell, um, is also part of the endomembrane system. When you get these vesicles, say this one right here at the bottom of my screen, that's going to um, move things to the plasma membrane, those are called those are called secretory vesicles again because they are going to so this guy they are going to secrete or uh, push stuff out of the cell through exocytosis so endomembrane system, this um, coordinated uh, group of organelles. Now you're going to see that not all organelles are part of the endomembrane system. So some of the other important organelles um, of eukaryotic cells, mitochondria. Remember that the mitochondria is where ATP, most of your ATP is made in cellular respiration. Uh, 
Um, we have the cytoskeleton. We will be spending time um, talking about the cytoskeleton in chapter 13. The cytoskeleton are protein fibers and um, they're made up of three different kinds of protein fibers. We have microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. Those are the three main components of the cytoskeleton. Cytoskeleton is really important for keeping the shape of the cell, helping the cell move during cell division. Um, centrioles are also um, made up of microtubules and these are important for cell division. So you might remember spindle fibers and mitosis and meiosis. Um, let's see what other terms. Nucleolus we will talk about I believe in chapters 16 and 19. This is the site of ribosomal subunit um, assembly. So not for the whole ribosomes but the subunits um, are made, the large and small subunits are made here, and then they leave the nucleus, and then on the rough ER or in the cytoplasm, they actually come together. And the last, oh, here it is. Oh, so ribosomes, remember, are um, these little protein RNA, a lot of times drawn like a, kind of like a snowman, site of, protein synthesis or of translation. Hopefully this is all coming back to you. Um, and cytoplasm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it up here. So cytoplasm is all of this yellow, all the fluid inside the cell. There's another term called cytosol, and I will tell you a lot of times I get lazy and I, I sometimes interchange them or just say cytoplasm. The cytosol is technically the fluid inside the cell minus the organelles. So it's really the yellow stuff. And the, the reason for this distinction is that um, you can basically take a cell and lyse it, so break it open and get the cytoplasm and then you can, through centrifugation, which is um, your next final lecture to listen to for this unit, through centrifugation you can separate out all these um, organelles in the cytoplasm and then you just have this fluid left and we call that the cytosol. Um, I'm not going to get super picky with that, uh, mainly because I'm lazy with it. So if I'm lazy with it, I'll let you guys be lazy with it. All right, um, so one of your objectives for Chapter 4 is to review the organelles um, for eukaryotic cell, um, and that leads us into the endosymbiont theory, or you may have learned it as the theory of endosymbiosis. Same difference. And the reason I want to review this with you is it's, it's important for understanding some of the characteristics of um, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. So the idea is that once upon a time there was a prokaryotic cell, right? has DNA, but it doesn't have a nucleus, it doesn't have any organelles, and that that cell grew. And the only way it can grow, right, 
we know that you have to keep that good surface area to volume ratio because to get things to diffuse in and out of the cell, you need the cell to have large surface area, small volume. So if you're going to grow and get larger volume, you have to create surface area. And one of the ways you create surface area is by folding in the plasma membrane. So now you started to have more membrane, right? So that means you're increasing surface area while you're increasing the volume. Okay, so you want to keep that surface area to volume ratio large okay, so that you have lots of surface area. And we believe that eventually that infolding of the membrane became the nuclear envelope, which remember is a double membrane. So you can kind of imagine as you folded this in, you've got double membranes happening. Okay, so now we have a cell with a nucleus and it's starting to develop this endomembrane system, but it needs a way to make energy. So the idea is that perhaps, perhaps a little bacteria, prokaryotic cell came swimming by and got into this larger cell and instead of the larger cell eating it and destroying it, they lived happily ever after, right? So the what we know is the mitochondria now is inside in a symbiotic relationship. So everybody's, or both parties are, are helping each other. So the idea is that this could do aerobic respiration and lo and behold, now our cell could make its own energy um, and use its own food and that became a eukaryotic cell. So the idea is that mitochondria was once a free-living bacteria. It was kind of engulfed into this larger cell and they became, um, uh, had a nice relationship and stayed together. Happily ever after. For plants and some protists, which are the little guys like amoeba and paramecium, um, my favorite is euglena because it's a photosynthetic protist, so they're swimming around in the water. Especially plants, they were able to take in a photosynthetic prokaryote, which became the chloroplast. So they were also, they were now able to make their own food. And energy. Right? So aerobic respiration, make energy. You get a chloroplast in there. So maybe this little guy swam, got taken in. Um, and now we had um, photosynthetic photosynthetic cells that could make their own food, their own sugars, and their own energy. So we call these mitochondria and chloroplasts, we call these semi-autonomous organelles. Right? So they're kind of on their own. They can kind of take care of themselves. So what's some of the evidence that this theory of endosymbiosis happened? So when we look at mitochondria and chloroplasts, we notice that they both have, there it is, they both have DNA and it's actually circular DNA. So bacteria have circular DNA. And so the DNA of mitochondria and chloroplasts looks in structure very similar to bacterial or prokaryotic DNA. The other bits of evidence that uh, support the theory of endosymbiosis is this double membrane. So both chloroplasts have an uh, where am I? 
external and internal membrane and mitochondria also have an inner and outer membrane. And so if you look here, what it's hard to see is, what it's trying to show you is that this thing was taken in by say endocytosis and it created a second membrane around the chloroplast and the mitochondria. They also have ribosomes. No other organelle, there it is, has a, its own ribosome. And these ribosomes inside the mitochondria, inside the chloroplast, are more similar to prokaryotic ribosome structure than eukaryotic ribosomes. So they're more similar to prokaryotic ribosomes. They have different sizes, they have some different components. So here again, back to the semi-autonomous, these guys are kind of on their own because they have DNA and they have ribosomes, so they can make some of their own proteins. But they can't totally live on their own because through the years and evolution, um, they have become dependent on the cell. So the cell in the nucleus of the cell encodes for some of the proteins that are necessary for mitochondria and chloroplast to function. They're not autonomous anymore, so you can't isolate a mitochondria and have it continue to do ATP synthesis and divide. Uh, I guess I should say, the, most importantly, divide. Um, it's got to have some of the proteins from the um, nucleus, and the same with the chloroplast. So they're still dependent on the cell. The last bit of evidence that the mitochondria and chloroplast were a result of the endosymbiont theory is that the size is similar to a prokaryote. So mitochondria and chloroplasts are about the size of um, bacteria. So we've got circular DNA, a double membrane, prokaryotic-like ribosomes, and similar size that all contribute to this idea that these were once free-living prokaryotes, bacteria, that were taken into a larger cell and then um, started basically working together and, and, like I said, lived happily ever after. Okay, so we've talked about the insides of the cell. Um, you've, talked, you've looked at differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and so the final topic for this uh, lecture is the extracellular matrix. Um, this comes up in chapter 15. And what I just want you to understand is extracellular means outside the cell. And it's a matrix. So here's an um, electron uh, micrograph um, scanning of the network that you can see for the ECM. So if you see ECM extracellular matrix, so it's this network of fibers. And the two main components are collagen, which is protein fiber, and proteoglycan, which means protein plus glycan sugar. So the extracellular matrix, not only is this meshwork, but it's kind of sticky. And the functions of the ECM um, is physical support for cells, it helps cells connect to each other, it helps cells communicate, and it builds tissue. And we're not going to get into the level of tissue um, in this course. That's a really anatomy and physiology course. Um, but understand that this extracellular matrix is important for building tissues and for allowing cells to um, interact and uh, kind of keep together. 
So again, big overviews right now just to get your mind going and um, review some things and you will get more in depth in all of these con concepts, sorry, um, in future chapters. All right, thanks.